Ladies of our panel and guests, we welcome you to an exciting opportunity to chat and learn from three very inspiring women who have achieved many successes already. And judging by how fabulous and young you all look, I have a sneaky suspicion you aren't done yet. I am Desai Fisser, the Head of Distribution for Wealth Management South Africa. While we have the privilege of connecting with you online in this way, it is important to reflect on connectivity and connections in general. At NetBank Private Wealth and NetBank Financial Planning, we use our globally integrated and advice-led approach to connect your financial decisions to your goals and your aspirations. The reality is that every choice we face in all aspects of our lives has financial consequences and vice versa. The decision we make about our money every day affects our future choices and our ability to protect what is important to us and achieve our goals. And that is why we at NetBank Private Wealth and NetBank Financial Planning, we refer to Connected Wealth. We help you make those connections more visible and therefore more manageable. I am also so excited the choices you each have faced as you have traveled your journeys, ladies. And just some housekeeping about today's session. Please use the Q&A chat box on the left-hand side to submit questions during the webinars. If your screen happens to free webinar, please press the refresh button and it will take you back to where you stopped last in the webinar. You will receive an email in the next few days with a link to a recording of the webinar in case you would like to share this and watch it again. Mapala will be facilitating our conversation today. She is an award-winning personal finance coach, City Press columnist, and best-selling author of the personal finance book, You Are Not Broke, You Pre Rich. What a wonderful title for a book. It is so inspiring and hopeful and galvanizing. And for everyone else out there who is pre rich listening, we are going to find out from these these ladies, what they have learned. What did you do differently when you were privileged? And how can we all benefit from these insights? Over to you, Mapala. Thank you so much, Lise. I am really excited to be part of today's webinar. Kinnam Mapala Maku, I'm a personal finance columnist and published author of the book, You Are Not Broke, Your Pre Rich, as Lise has mentioned. And it is such a pleasure to be hosting the NetBank Private Wealth and NetBank Financial Planning webinar. So just to give you a quick overview about today's webinar, we will be focusing on the ups and downs of entrepreneurship, the importance of having a plan for financial success, and managing your money with your significant half. I know it's a touchy subject, but trust me, we are going to demystify it and get comfortable with talking about money with our families and our partners. As Lizanne mentioned earlier, we have a panel of really powerful women who have stamped their mark in male-dominated fields, from media and broadcasting to restauranteering. So please allow me to introduce you to your two panelists for today. Our first panelist is the popular multi-award winning celebrity chef, restaurateur, and Harvard Business School case study, Sibam Dongana. Hi Siba, and welcome to the NetBank Private Wealth and NetBank Financial Planning webinar. Before we start, please give us a bit of background into who Sibam Dongana really is. Thanks, Mapalo. Yes, I'm Sivam Tongana, and I originally hail from the Eastern Cape, M. Danzane. That's the township I come from. I am the last one of six kids. <laughs> I come from a very big family, um, but I am based in Cape Town now and have four kids of my own. They are all under the ages of 10. So I'm the crazy mom whose life is cray cray. Um, and I've got the privilege of having to do it all with the business, kids, family, and being your wife. Many of you will know me from Siva's table on Food Network and probably know me as Miss Vava Boom and Miss Siva Licious. Um, the show has aired in over 135 countries and is in every continent and has won numerous awards, which I am always grateful for, uh, specifically for that opportunity with Food Network. But more recently, I am back on screen and have a cooking show with a local channel called Honey on Channel 173. And the name of the 
the show is House of Chefs. So be sure to look it up if you haven't seen it already. Now, often people ask me a question as to what inspired me to be a chef. And part of the part of the answer for that is I don't have a specific person who inspired, who inspired me to be a chef, but I have a series of people who played a huge influence in my life that really made food to be a thing that I really wanted to pursue. One of them being my mother. Um, who loved cooking and she had magical hands. My mom, Umama, could cook the most incredible meal using just a handful of ingredients. Plus, um, you know, lots of other people that I have never even met, like the likes of Nigella Lawson, Jamie Oliver, uh, Martha Stewart, and many, 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 many more. Those are some of the people that influenced me into turning my passion into a thriving business. Hence, the Siva Co. was born about 14 years ago. I look forward to sharing some of those nuggets with you, the ups and the downs of business. Thank you so much, Siba. And I'm really looking forward to hearing how you were able to grow the Siba Co. brand and the restaurant associated with the brand into an industry leader in the food service trade. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our second panelist, who is none other but the award-winning primetime business radio show host and senior anchor on one of Africa's foremost news channels, Guguletu Mfupi. Welcome, Gooks. And I'm sure it must feel rather strange now to be on the other side of the mic. But before I hand over to you, I know most of us know you as a broadcaster and a financial journalist, but is there another side to Gugu that we perhaps are not aware of? Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Mapalo. You are quite right. It's very different being on the other side of the desk where the conversation is directed at me. But as you mentioned, my name is Kukule Tumfupi, and I work essentially as a conversation strategist. Now, many might ask themselves, what on earth does that mean? That essentially means that in a lot of spaces that I work and operate in, I fundamentally base my work on the art of conversation, whether in broadcasting, on TV and radio platforms, or whether it is by engaging with corporate clients and executing uh, conversations for them through a variety of conferences, webinars, and really making sure that we address critical questions and themes that they'd like to explore with some key stakeholders. So this has really become a dream job, I guess, for me, one that uh, growing up as a little girl was inspired by wanting to balance the ambition of being a chartered accountant, which would fulfill all my curiosity about the world of business and enterprise, at the same time having a great passion for public speaking and interacting with people as I uh, am quite a social individual who engages and loves learning from the thoughts and the mindsets from different people from different backgrounds. Now, most of this was encouraged uh, through my early childhood, born and bred in Johannesburg, but growing up in the south of Johannesburg, both in Soweto as well as a township called Ennerdale, I was fortunate enough to be uh, incorporated into a world of global thinking, interacting with individuals from different cultures, despite making sure that I have myself and my roots firmly in the ground to understand the local dynamics of the environment that I grew up in. And that really, I guess, shaped my view on the world in terms of the kind of impact that I've always wanted to have. Interestingly enough, Mabalo, people often ask me, so what's the end goal or what do you want to do or what is your definition of success? And for me, when I sit back and I think about it, a large majority of it stems back to the fact that I do want to have a positive impact in the lives of those that I meet. And some might think that that's quite you know, frivolous and sounds quite polite, but I think that one can have a positive impact in a variety of ways not only in the interpersonal relationships that we're able to form with friends and family and partners, but most importantly, the kind of impact that we have with individuals that we engage with. What do we teach them about business? What do we teach them about this world that we live in? And what do we teach ourselves about the environment that we interact with and what it actually means about self-discovery and self-awareness? So I guess if you had to ask me why I chose to become a financial journalist, a broadcaster, a conversation strategist, essentially someone who chooses and opts to engage with people for a living, it's really to ensure that the goal, the ambition, the desire to leave a positive mark in the lives of people that I meet will hopefully one day be fulfilled. Thank you so much, Gugu. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your insights on good financial habits. Now, we are going to get right into the Q&A. And Siba, I'll start with you. 
you opened your restaurant, Siba, the restaurant in 2020. This was right smack in the middle of a pandemic when there was a lot of uncertainty. What gave you the courage to go ahead with your plans? Oh, it's such a great question and a question, um, Apollo, that majority of people often ask me because it was a very brave move to have done that. And it was a series of things. It wasn't one one specific thing, but it was a series of things. One of them was that I had been planning a, a, to have a restaurant for quite some time, for about four and a, four, four years and a half, almost five years. And, you know, we were quite specific as to where we wanted to start. Ma, major, majority of my... Um, of my clientele is in Johannesburg. So it just made sense that we start in Joburg. And, you know, we already had a secured venue in the north, a beautiful place, et cetera, and partners and all of that. And just as we were about to launch, we had a slight delay in launching December uh, 2019. So we thought we we're going to launch in um, April of the, other, of the following year, 2020, the big year. And we're so excited. And when we went into the lockdown, we thought this is just going to be, you know, we're going to move the opening to September or we'll move it to December or whatever it was, only to find out that all the plans that had gone into the four years just went into almost nothing at the time. It was devastating. It was really devastating. And also from my, you know, partners um, and having built partners and relationship for us to go ahead. Now, let's go back to um, to lockdown. Within lockdown, I really felt, you know, as, as a woman, as a mother, that I was overwhelmed a lot, especially that beginning phase, that first six months, having to homeschool, having to, you know, do it all within the house. The house, which was a sanctuary, when, I mean, when we usually come home, our kids scream for us and say, mommy, mommy, daddy, you know, they get the heroes welcome. But we didn't get that anymore because we were all mixed in. Instead, I was the mom shouting because it was just so overwhelming. I, I realized that, you know, I'm not the only person who, who might be experienced experiencing this, probably many other women and just families in general are feeling under pressure. And I thought, let me revisit the restaurant concept. But this time started in Cape Town, started small um, and then, you know, find other partners. And then I approached Sun International um, at the time. And luckily they had a space and they, it just made sense. And I, I gave them my whole concept. And they said, we've got a space for you. Come, let's go. So it was basically that I wanted to create a sanctuary or a place where a people can just escape the home, which has now become this mad space for about three hours, very similarly to how you would go and uh, get a massage um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a beauty parlor. So I wanted to give people that experience the, from a service perspective, the food, like a beautiful pamper, because I myself, was the clientele because I needed an escape to just um, have a space where I can just be treated very nicely. So that's what, what happened with the restaurant. And I think also from an entrepreneurial perspective, it's my entrepreneurial journey and, 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 and hard to push, even though the, the even though the situations around us are all are always not as great as they as they seem or as they are. There's always a silver lining in the clouds, and I look for those silver linings, and I you know and I take them. So that was the inspiration behind opening the restaurant. Oh, that is fantastic, Ziba. And you know what? As a mom myself, I know that hard lockdown took such a toll on us. So. I applaud you for really going ahead with your dreams. And for me, it tells me that you need to be flexible as an entrepreneur. Sometimes things are not always going to go according to plan. Mm, so true. All right. So now, Gugu, as a broadcast journalist, you often speak about investing in stock markets to get a high return. But I want to know from you, what investment have you made in your career that has yielded the best dividends to date? Oh, trick question, trying to put me on the spot there when it comes to numbers, right, Mapalo? But a very valid question, I guess, because on a day-to-day -day basis, so I talk about the markets, I talk about the variety of asset classes that are available for individuals to invest in. And I must tell you, Mapalo, when I first got introduced to the world of investing, it was actually at one of my first few jobs working as a financial journalist, where a colleague actually said to me, you know, these products that we talk about, these exchange-traded funds and unit trusts, do you actually own one? Do you have one? And I sat back as 
23, 22 year old me and I said, no, actually, I'm, I'm not too sure if I have enough money to invest in any of those. And she actually took me through a step by step to get myself invested in my very first ETF. Uh, and to date, that's actually been one of my greatest investments. And I'll tell you why. It's not because it turned me into a multimillionaire overnight, because as we know, that's not how investments happen. But it actually taught me about the understanding and the discipline of investing. Number one, to understand that one is able to start small and to start with what they have. And number two, to start where you are with the knowledge that you have and with the people around you who are able to add more value in terms of the information that they're able to share. That in itself then opened my eyes into this world and this periphery of uh, the environment of investing that's available. So from there, built up into starting a few businesses, some worked out, some didn't, uh, expanding my portfolio into the equities environment. Uh, and of course, also understanding that you're not just limited to the sphere of shares that might be investable in South Africa, but even looking offshore and understanding the opportunities that do exist uh, within the global market environment. So I would say uh, I guess the big lesson that everyone could potentially learn from that is definitely to start small, start where you are and start with what you have. Um, millionaires weren't made overnight and uh, weren't necessarily born into millions. So sometimes you just need to, you know, get the passion and the information to allow you just to step forward with what you have and where you are. I absolutely love that, uh, Gugu, because for me, you've just highlighted the importance of having someone who's an expert or someone who can hold your hand and say, hey, this is how you go about this. Because oftentimes I think we get intimidated. We feel like, you know, there's just too much information, but having the right partner to, to hold your hand and take you through these things is very important. Okay, Siba, often now the biggest obstacle to starting a new business venture is Funding is a big one, right? How mm -hmm. did you raise funding for Siba the Restaurant or your other business ventures? All right. So how I've raised my capital in the past, um, I'm the I'm I'm the do it all <laughs> entrepreneur. You know, I save up, I invest, I plan ahead, I make sure that you know I live minimalistic in order to um to make sure that my dreams come to life. So that's how I've done it in the past. I've always made sure that all my ventures are self-invested. And what's lovely is that, you know, I've got an opportunity, I've, I've had over the past few years an opportunity to uh, work overseas where I'm paid in different currencies, which when translated into our money, then obviously yields a whole lot more. And that has really been such a great um, help for me in, in what I do. But besides that, with the restaurant, um, I did need someone to assist me with it because of the capital finances that you need from the beginning so i put up um you know it um uh, uh a portion, a big portion of that uh, from my side and then also I have an investor who are my partners uh, SI, um, Sun International in this sense, uh, who are my partners who put up the rest and then obviously over time you then you know, it then paid off but what's lovely is that we've come to a, a, a beautiful space now where I no longer need to be held in the hand <laughs> um, to where I completely own the restaurant and it's a leasing agreement uh, which is where we wanted to be in the beginning but I needed that first few months of just help in order to be able to just get through that bucket of money that I needed. And you know what, I, 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 I've always been afraid of asking for money. And that's the honest truth, because, you know, because I'm afraid of debt, number one, because I come from a family where we lived from hand to mouth, not that my parents were irresponsible, but the circumstances that at the time were just, there was no other way but to get to the loan shark and ask for money if the bank didn't want to give you money, etc. So I didn't like how you know, how my parents lived and, and when it came to finances and how close finances are, how a subject, what a big subject it was from a communications point of view. So, so from my side, I always want to try as much as I can to raise the capital funds myself. If not, then I can go to the second person and then help me. In the pro at the moment, we're in a process of, uh, fi of uh, getting um, uh, um, funders for our next project. So, yeah, I'm on the market and might be knocking at doors. <laughs> Goodness. I have I haven't I haven't really experienced the process of having to be fully funded for something because I've always done it myself. So this is the first time where I'm a little bit letting go and allowing people in to help me when it comes to money. Oh goodness, Siba, you really sound like a lady on the move and I absolutely love it. 
what stands out for me is that you make sacrifices for the things you want. And I don't think as entrepreneurs or people on social media, we make statements like that often enough for people to see if you want something, you have to make sacrifices. And for me, it says that you put your money where your mouth is. So now talking about obstacles, hiring the right talent in your business is one of the single most important things you can do in a business, right? Yet it is the most challenging. How have you dealt with hiring the wrong person or not the right fit for your business? It's a very hard one because, you know, it's very, it, it, you know, we go through the, we, we're hiring soon. Yay, I'm so happy. We're hiring soon for the restaurant. We're about to reopen after we've refurbished. Um, and this this question is very pertinent because this is where I am in my, in, 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 um, in my business journey. We're hiring very soon. And in the past, what, what has happened is I really rely on my instincts. And sometimes it might be a sense of a person might be highly skilled and highly talented. But if they're not a fit to my brand, or if they're not a, if they're not a fit to who I am, then those for me are the signs that they may not be able to fit into the culture of what I'm creating or what we have already created. So that's very important. And if I have made maybe the mistake of hiring someone who's not perfectly fit, so I would, for instance, give them a three months probation, which gives them the you know enough time to feel whether this is what they want or not, and then gives us the same. But uh, but equally so, I would then. Um, I'll speak with the person, you know, be open, open about them and say, you know, how about we move you to this department rather? Because as, as you work with people, you then see what they're most passionate about or what their key skills um, are. And what's, uh, what's lovely with my business is that I've, had, I've employed a lot of youth and a lot of youngsters who are not yet established. So it was very easy to mold, to direct and to just help them and to gear them within my business of where they are perfectly fitted. I do think it would have been perhaps more difficult if it was someone, if, if I had employed a wrong person who is much older and therefore it's like, well, this is my job and this is what you had um, employed me to do and etc. So I've never been in that position as yet, but we are hiring. But what I can say is that the gut feel and, you know, I'm a, I'm a spiritual person. I'm Apollo. I, I pray about these matters, you know, for God to give me the spirit of discernment, for God to help me, you know, bring the right people. And when we're going through CVs, not to miss any important CV, that might be the right person for us. And also look beyond the CVs because not everybody is able to articulate themselves well on paper. So it's important that when we speak with the person, we are able to to get the feel because people need to buy into the vision of the business so that whether you're there or not, they're not skimping on doing the job. I love that. So look beyond the CV and most importantly, trust your gut. All right. Now, Gooks, we know that managing, managing one's finances, especially as a freelancer, can be challenging because of the inconsistent income. What is the one thing that keeps you on track with your finances? That's such a very good point there, Mabalo, and I, uh, I actually had to sit back for a moment to actually digest this question because as I do think about it, I realize that there are certain lessons within my journey that I was quite cognizant of avoiding to uh, ensure that I don't fall into that trap of, of uh, relying on freelance income. Uh, and primarily when I did transition into the world of speaking and becoming more of an entrepreneur, fortunately enough for me, I did have the buffer and the backing of still having a fixed term contract with my then previous employer, who then turned into becoming a client of mine. And that's because it was always a concerted effort to make sure that I developed the necessary entrepreneurial skills to then transition, you know, into being a sole proprietor, then moving into being an entrepreneur who then is able to actually establish an entity that pays me a fixed income. So that's one of the tricks of the trade that I think a lot of entrepreneurs or even creatives or, or, or speakers, people within the media, uh, maybe even in sporting fraternities as well, typically for privy to, you know, into the pitfalls of where there isn't a plan to ensure that you do create a sustainable income for yourself. And the simplistic way to look at it is that you need to look at yourself as a business. The hours you put into creating the food, the content, uh, the writing, the speaking material that you're going to put forward, calculate those overheads. How much time is it taking from you? What are the costs that go into, you know, participating in a platform like this from the ring lights to uh, the digital equipment to the Wi-Fi and the data? 
All of those are small intricacies that really do need to be taken into account for you to make sure that you're able to charge adequately as a business, account for those particular costs. And then from there, that positions you to know, OK, if these are my overheads. Um, this is the kind of income that I'm looking for to make sure that I cover my expenses, but also have enough to actually create a form of income for myself. And once this income does come into your business, treat yourself not as the director and the owner and the prime shareholder of all these things that are wonderful, but as Siba mentioned, you do need to have a, a great sense of discernment uh, and discipline to make sure that whilst you're growing and saving and investing for the future growth prospects that you'd like to attain, you need to keep that discipline and commitment to yourself that, look, I'm going to live below my means minimalistically to make sure uh, that there is a bigger picture and that there's greater sustainability to what we do. Because if a life has taught us anything, Mabalo, and I guess we've all experienced it through the lockdown, right? Uh, it's been the lockdown, it's been the limitations on income, even individuals within fixed employment, uh, full-time employment have had salary cuts or their jobs come to an end. So one really does to think of themselves as an entity and how it is that you're going to keep this entity as a going concern, as is often used in accounting terms. So I think for me, the one lesson, don't see yourself or view yourself as a freelancer. Figure out how your side hustle, uh, the other elements that you participate in can actually work and operate and function as a business for yourself where you are able to earn your own salary. So I think for me, it's very important to separate the two entities. There is you then there is the business and manage your money accordingly because it can get very murky very quickly when you are at Willys and you're swiping from your business card. So yeah. don't do that. Separate your business from your uh, personal finances. Thank you so much, Google. So now how do you balance saving or investing for your goals and helping those around you, Google, um, as we call it black tax? Mm, I know you have a whole chapter about black tax in your book. <laughs> you're, not, you're not broke, you're pre rich. And the truth is, it's an uncomfortable conversation for many, right? Um, and different because our family dynamics and setups are not the same. I come from a family where, fortunately, both my parents um, uh, you know, have been able to save for their retirement quite adequately. But as a child who still wants to make them proud and you know, offer them, you know, uh, lighten the load, I guess, in terms of the sacrifices that they've made for me, I am very concerted of playing a more active role, um, even in their lives, the lives of my nieces and my nephews, who I call my deputy children, as they rightfully are. Um, so for me, what I've actually identified is... Uh, Play a need where play a role where you best are able to dictate what kind of role you're able to play. And that often comes with very clear communication where I've been able to say to my parents or to my loved ones that this is where I'm able to assist. Uh, at times it comes as a great surprise to them. And at times uh, there might be slight levels of disappointment when you have to, you know, identify and make mention of the fact that, hold on, uh, I've got these objectives and goals that I'd like to meet for myself financially first. So whilst I can't help you with this full fee that you require, I'm able to help you out with 20% or give me six more months. And then once I've uh, managed to uh, provide a buffer for myself, then I'll be able to, to, to step foot in there. So definitely clear communication. Um, I, I realize that this might not always be easy for people because the truth is money is too tight to mention. Um, and sometimes it can bring out um, unnecessary conflicts that might occur between family members and friends. And speaking of that, Mabalo, that's also another lesson that I've had to learn is that sometimes with friends or with family, when you actually tend to borrow people money or loan them money, make sure that you do it with the expectation of not getting that money back. Because the truth is, once you hand it over, once you sent it through with a bank notification, uh, life happens. Uh, and unfortunately, circumstances are not always ideal. Sometimes friends and people can be dishonest. Sometimes people are not able to meet their obligations because they're actually overwhelmed. So I've actually found sometimes it's best to address the question to say, look, uh, I understand that this is how much you need. Uh, this is as far as, as, as I'm willing to go into in helping you. But do understand that uh, you will be the one to decide when you'll pay me back. And I found that that often uh, creates a greater sense of discipline, encouragement and motivates the person who's lending you the money to realize, OK, that's quite a great responsibility she's put in my hands. And if I'm looking to still have this person as a friend or someone I can call on for when I need help, um, I best make sure that I'm able to pay them back when I can. And when the money doesn't come back, my balloon, write it off. Don't ruin the friendship if, 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 you know, things don't have to go that way. But be cognizant, though, of, of how it is that you manage um, um, your relationships with friends and with money. But for me, I, that's my rule. Um, where I can, I will help. But I do so knowing very well that I it's a fee that I'm essentially writing off because at times, yeah, money can ruin some some very important relationships and friendships.
Yeah. And I guess that's why a lot of people say they do not mix money and friends at all. But I think what I'm gathering from you is that you need to have clear communication when it comes to your family and friends about money, but also very important to set boundaries as well, because boundaries help keep the relationship, you know, to say, I will give you money, but I'm not expecting it back or I'm expecting it on such and such a date or this is only how much I can give you. So I think boundaries also are very important. Now, Siba, knowing what you know now, is there anything that you would change or do differently from when you started? Most certainly, uh, most certainly. And one of them is having a mentor. Um, Google spoke about it a bit earlier on that when she started um, on, on her venture in terms of business, she had someone who took her through the process. And I think, you know, as much as it's great because, you know, I, I've built my business from scratch. So I know, you know, the, the everything about my business and I know, you know I could give advice and have seminars on what not to do or what to do uh, because I've been through the highs and the lows but I do feel that you know should I have had a person earlier on in my life who could just guide me a little bit better who can help me monetize my business and a little bit better it would have made such a huge difference and i think and, and 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 this was such a big thing for me um especially in my early early days uh, in my early 20s because i i almost had a sense of i could do more but i didn't know how and it it also comes from the fact that I am the first entrepreneur in my family and, you know, and it's not as if I had an uncle who can help me on how to put a business plan together. And if I go to a, uh, to a place, they will say to me, um, oh, it costs 60,000 for a business plan. AP, where, where do I get 60,000 from? You know, or where do I get 30,000? from you know i don't even have that much mu that much i didn't even have that much amount of money back then in order to be able to do that and just financial decisions how to make your business com um compliant um in terms of you know um the governance of your business and also you know as much as you know people often say follow your passion and i'm in agreement with that but there's a very fine line with uh, with following your passion and 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 business because your passion for instance my passion is, is culinary and it is food it's science and it's nutrition but that's a separate entity altogether that's not business mm. so a specific set of mind that need, one needs to have when it comes to business. Therefore, I would say have the passion and the skill, but also go for business. Go and do a one-year course or a two-year course, whatever uh, time or money allows you to just open yourself up on how to run a business from scratch so that you don't have to fall onto the many loopholes or, or gaps that many, like me, for instance, have fallen into so that you can run a whole lot quicker. So that's what I would say. Yeah. So with mentorship, I think it's a, such a big one. And oftentimes you get people, and I'm sure it happens to you as well, Siba and Google, where people will DM you or email you and say, hey, can you be my mentor? What do you say to those people? Because for me, I feel like sometimes you are sharing so much information already that that is a form of mentorship. What do you say to someone who's looking at you and think, thinking, oh, goodness, Siba, I want you to be my mentor? So what I say to them is that they must first follow what have already that what's already out there. Because truth be told, mentorship is also quite involving. And to promise someone you're going to mentor them, it means they take on your personal time. And I'm a mother of four. <laughs> Just to give you um, a picture of my time, I am a mother of four. You know, I do run my own business, so my time is is a very rare um, a resource. Um, so I, I say to them, they must first go check Google everything that I've done so far, interviews, etc., because that's the first lot. And I, I, what I found in terms of mentoring on my side is that I got mentors through books. Mm. I've got through YouTube, I got mentors through a friend who knows a friend. I got mentors through um, someone's like, oh my goodness, I'm stuck with this. I don't know how to do it. Um, and I'll speak with my best friend, um, who's also the MD of my company. I'll say, Lisa, please, how how do we how do we do this? And then she she'll just say, okay, I'll do this and this and this and this. But it takes time for people to get to that level. Um, so I'd say use a lot of what's already available to empower yourself because 
it's not practical for one person to mentor many different people at the same time. What I do now is that I, for instance, open myself up for having certain lessons. For instance, one of my one of the partnerships that I, I currently have is with KLM Empowered, which is an education a higher education institution, and this is part of me having to mentor um, people uh, when it comes to business. So I, I I partner with certain people who are going to not take the bulk of the work when it comes to the administrative side of it because it's not that you don't want to help people it's it's not that it's the administration of it and the time it takes for you to be able to help it but by partnering with uh, klm empowered it means that they're going to help me with that and i'm going to come with the core scale of business yeah. of food of this which is what i want to give without having to you know do the everyday running of it which then helps me also not to let go of what i'm already doing because also you must remember i've got a restaurant to run i've got this to do i've got that to do i've got that to do so mm -hmm. that that really, really, really helps. Yeah. So for me, it really says don't be rigid in your definition of mentorship. Thank mentorship you. you can get in multiple, multiple, multiple ways. Now, Gugu, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Do you think that in a marriage or relationship, a woman should have her own financial advisor or they should shed, have a shared financial advisor? And I say this and I ask you this question because oftentimes I get emails or DMs from women and saying, you know what, we have a financial advisor, but I don't quite think they get me. So do you think a woman should have their own financial advisor? Yeah, you're quite literally putting me on the spot here, right? <laughs> Especially given that there's an audience that we're serving uh, of financial advisors who probably have stories of their own about the dynamics that are that are uh, derived from this. And I think it's, it's twofold, Mapalo. It really is a question that needs to be answered through self-introspection, self-awareness and a key understanding of the relationships that you've developed with either your spouse, uh, which is also quite important because the person you choose to marry <laughs> influences a large majority of the decisions that you take in life. That's one of the most important decisions that one does need to make, including the relationship that you have with your financial advisor, because essentially this is a person who is going to journey with you on the various life milestones, the goals, the objectives that you have, uh, and they, they're meant to be there to hold you to account. So I think first things first is for one, if you are a woman who's lucky enough to actually have had her own financial advisor, perhaps review that relationship. Uh, if things have been working for you, continue that journey going and also don't limit yourself. As uh, um, Siba mentioned in the theme regarding mentorship, we really live in a world where we are open to uh, analyze and assess the various options that might be out there. So whether you gain some insights and nuggets from a book, from a YouTube channel, from podcasts, or even from consulting with other financial advisors, do make sure that you absorb as much information firstly to establish that the uh, partner that you're moving on with in terms of your financial advice that you're soliciting uh, is, is reliable, reputable, and that you gel because it really is a, a marriage of finance. And then coming to the other marriage of finances, oh boy, I've had my own faux pas in this uh, particular dynamic where when I was previously managed, I, married, I actually, um, gosh, shouldn't have said that, hey, previously <laughs> married, unmanaged. <laughs> That's why things didn't work out. Um, but primarily, I did actually introduce my former spouse to my financial advisor. And it only took me in hindsight, as I reflect on that particular journey, that my former spouse and my financial advisor actually didn't gel. Uh, and that's, I guess, because I brought someone into this relationship um, to partner with me and to journey. Um, and I guess how I assess it now in hindsight is that the intention was quite clear because this is a life partner that you're looking to build with. So hence, we wanted to get the same advice, same guidance and clarity to make sure that our visions and our goals are also aligned. And that also becomes very important because I think many financial planners and advisors will tell you that sometimes they sit in consultations with married couples and then the one spouse will come back to say, hold on, I know that I agreed to that particular arrangement with my spouse, but actually I'd like to set something else up that you shouldn't disclose to my spouse. So it really calls for one to understand in this relationship, number one, your marriage, are you able to have clarity and, and, and a clear vision and make sure that you're both aligned in terms of the goals and objectives that you want? And does that then translate into the relationship that you're going to establish with your financial planner? Will you both be honest, transparent and clear and in alignment um, with the suggestions and recommendations that can be made by your financial planner? So it's a tricky one, Mapalo, and I really think there is no right or wrong answer, um, but like one's health, like one's money, like one's uh, personal life, 
all of this really does boil down to having a very clear sense of uh, self-awareness, understanding the goals and objectives you have, what your partner's objectives are within your marriage, and how that then aligns with the kind of financial planning uh, and, and assistance that you're actually seeking. And also making sure that you both hear each other out, because sometimes people have different philosophies around money, different experiences around money. Siba mentioned she's um, scared of having debt. I can relate, because I also grew up in a household where my mother hated debt, and it was a nightmare for her to pay it off on a month-to-month -month basis. But there are other people who actually use debt very well as a tool to access greater capital, to buy the resources that they need and actually don't mind having the month on month commitments um, as long as it actually provides them with the opportunities that they require. So I think it's very important to make sure that your money philosophy and your relationship with money speaks to that of your spouse firstly and of course secondly then speaks to the kind of financial advice uh, that you will be seeking from a financial planner. So it's a tough one but calls for very difficult conversations to be had uh, but conversations that need to be had nonetheless because who you choose as a partner and as a financial advisor, are big decisions that will have an impact on your life. No, absolutely. And you know what? I will not add anything to that because I know it can be quite controversial. But for me, I would always say that go with someone that you gel with. Go with someone that you feel like, you know what, this person has my interest at heart. Um, it, whether it is your own financial ad, ad, advisor or that of your partner that you're sharing. But go with someone that you feel like, you know what, this person has my best interest at heart. All right, Gugu, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your younger self about career and money? Oof. Well, I'm hoping this self is still young enough, firstly, my partner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you're quite right. I think when it comes to uh, reflecting on, on where one has, has journeyed and how life has actually evolved and, and the goals and objectives that we want, and sometimes when you sit back and you have to reflect, I probably tell my younger self, when it comes to career, stay on the right track. You're on, you're on the right track because I believe a lot of us, when we try to uh, shift out of the norms of the careers that we'd like to follow, I started accounting, I studied accounting. My ambition was to become a CA and then later transitioned into the world of media before even serving articles because I thought, hey, let me give it a try. And, you know, as they say, the rest is history. And it's worked out quite favorably for me where I've been able to merge the passion of numbers um, with the passion of speaking and engaging with people. And I believe that when I started my career, I started off with a great sense of fear, a great sense of anxiety and, and uncertainty because you're literally crafting out a career for yourself that you've seen a few people do. But because your starting base is not the same, that adds to the frustration of not having any clarity of where the end goal is or never mind the end goal, you understand what your why and your objective is, but you're not sure how to actually connect the dots. So I believe trust your instincts, continue with that particular track and never stop investing in yourself. I believe sometimes when we get caught up in our careers, either working for large corporate entities or starting off in the world of entrepreneurship, those self-limiting beliefs can make you believe and feel stuck and you literally stick to this mainframe of uh, the environment that you're in. Uh, similarly to yourself and Siba, had Siba not decided to write a book, expand onto bigger broadcast stations, uh, expand to become a restauranteur, you know, start in developing a podcast, uh, and even you having left your corporate job previously, Mapalo, those are all elements that really speak to following your gut and identifying that, look, these are the spaces and spheres that I'd like to grow into. So go into them boldly because mistakes will happen, but that's exactly what they are. They're mistakes. You pick up, you learn from them, and you implement some of the solutions. I believe when it comes to money, Mapalo, um, I actually started off as a very great saver in my career, uh, but I wasn't very clear what I was saving for. And that then made it a lot easier for me to tap into those funds for conspicuous consumption or just spending it unnecessarily. Uh, and I believe had I had a little bit more discipline just in terms of actually identifying what the specific goal is uh, with the funding and the money that I was actually saving, then, uh, you know, things might have worked out quite diff differently. But I believe, number one, stick to the good habits that you're able to pick up. Uh, don't get into unnecessary debt if, if that's not necessary, but also understand how best you can use that opportunity to build up your credit profile, which in the long term will actually help you access some of the credit that you need. But if you are going to save, if you are going to invest, make sure that you're very particular and specific about the goals and objectives that you're setting aside to avoid uh, easy temptation and splurging on shoes when you already have enough pairs in the same color. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So keep on investing in yourself and have a definite 
financial goal. Now, Siba, we've spoken about Siba the entrepreneur. Now I'd like to find out about your relationship with money. <laughs> How important is it for you to have a financial plan in place, Siba? Oh, a financial plan in place for me is a sense of security. And I think that goes for the majority of women. Um, I remember when we had a session with my husband and we, we were, you know, our financial planner was explaining how, why it's so important for me <laughs> as a woman, because it's a sense of security for me. It means that not only am I taken care of, but my children are taken care of. It means that when, once I'm no longer here, you know, things still carry on without me. It's also a form of, you know, a, of wealth creation management and protecting that because of so much over the years I've built over the years and I want to make and sure and make sure that that's protected so for me you know it speaks it's really really speaks really really speaks to that and also I've made so many sacrifices in my business with my time with my personal money as I had explained earlier on that it 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 has to be protected and how i how i earn money is important how i save it is important and how i grow it is important and how i i then spend it is important yeah. as yeah. Uh, that's a, that's very important for me so having someone who's there who sometimes hits my hand and say no do not do that or sometimes for instance like a, like a very simple thing and like for instance you're looking for um something that will benefit the family but perhaps is not a necessity then they then are able to give you a full scope of what this new responsibility will be and if whether it's worth it or not so it's someone who can tap into an expertise that don't that i will have to read or you know um, um a whole lot more for me to have it it's someone who is an expert expert in that who does this for a living who can take my hand and say Siba I think you should do this I think you should do do, do it like this etc and it's been really great for me because I've managed to save a lot of money because because of that I've also managed to um to to save by not um going into um, expenditures, which, which would have been great, but a loss of money in the end. So, yeah, that 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 is number one for me. And so definitely having a financial plan is very important because you're saying it is security for you. But I think also you've highlighted a very important point that having that accountability partner goes a long, long, long way. Mm -hmm. Now, Siba, I often hear entrepreneurs say, I don't have retirement savings because my business is my retirement plan. What is your take on this? <laughs> well, to be honest, I started there because I didn't understand what yes. this was. You know, I started there when I was young. I was like, ah, I don't need to do this. My business is going to boom in the next 20 years and I'll, I'll retire at 40, you know, because that's what everybody was saying at the time. And we wanted to do it for ourselves and we just didn't want, you know. So it, it, at, in the beginning, that's what I thought was the way to go. But as you grow and as you learn, you, you then decide, you know what, there's so much at stake. You've got kids, you've got this, you've got that, you've got that. And also business in its entirety is also very fragile in a sense, it's become very fragile, um, and that you have to create uh, some form of protection or a safe landing for yourself, for yourself. So it's great if you're going to, you know, your business is going to be a retirement. I've seen it with some of my friends where they've started this, that all they do is start pockets of businesses. They grow them for the next five or six years and become something amazing. And then they sell them and they make lots of money, which is great. But it might not necessarily be true for everyone. So you need a safe landing. And that's why for me, that you know, having a, a retirement plan is very, uh, um, um, is very important. In actual fact, I know what my financial advisor would say. He would cringe, 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 um, and then he would say, "It's just like you know, it's it's just like cashing in for him. It's just like cashing in your retirement savings for." a business and i've seen this especially with our people with you know our people i've seen this a lot where people will cash in their entire retirement saving to start a business without ever having started any business ever in their lives and they're just hopeful that it's going to it's going to work and unfortunately most times it doesn't work and they end up you know on the negative um side of things so it's it's um it's a very clear one for me 
mine is I my, my route is very clear because I've got a perfect person who's holding my hand and helping me make the right decisions. <laughs> I love that, Siba. And one of the things that I think people are not aware of when they cash out their pension or provident funds is that it's not only that amount that you're cashing out, you are losing out on the compounding that would have happened had you just left that money. So I think you brought up a very important point. I know I'm looking at the time we need to wrap up. And now Google, managing one's finances is not linear. It definitely has its ups and downs. What is your biggest weakness when it comes to money? We all do. We all do. I know mine personally is spending or overspending on holidays. What is your biggest weakness when it comes to money? Oh, interesting one. Uh, you're quite right. I, I can relate to the overspending on holidays too. I'm one of those that when you are uh, uh, relaxed and uh, leisurely enjoying what you've worked so hard for, you know, you tend to become a little bit more liberal on spending. Uh, and what I've often found that I tend to overspend on is um, sometimes trying to acquire additional assets uh, and not uh, running through, you know, the, the, the full and clear calculations of it. So I, I guess a typical example is uh, the multiple technological tools that we actually use. Truth is, nobody needs uh, two laptops as well as a <laughs> PC, uh, just in case you need a, a backup. But that's often how I, I, I like to, to, to view it. And I guess how I comfort myself is in saying, well, I use these instruments to actually conduct my work. So one is actually a, an appropriate buffer that is helping me you know, uh, attain a future income uh, in terms of the work that I do. But that has definitely been a, a, a weak spot that I've, I've tightened up slightly, but there are still days when it slips away. And I must tell you, Mabalo, pre-lockdown, I used to love shoes with the world of conferencing and events that we'd go to, shoes. Uh, and I found that as, uh, the, 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 the little intricacies about uh, makeup and uh, beauty and just small things that actually make you feel better are still the things that I tend to consume. And so much like many other ladies, um, maybe the fashion sense has slowed down slightly, but uh, it's a perfume here and there to make myself feel good. And funny enough, there's actually a study behind this um, that was actually conducted by Estee Lauder, if I'm not mistaken. They call it the lipstick index, mm -hmm. that when uh, women actually find that they don't have uh, great opportunities or great amounts of income to actually splurge on the big stuff that they want. So you can't buy your new home, you can't buy the new furniture, you can't buy the new car, but what you'll actually buy is some lipstick or some other cosmetics to actually make yourself feel better. So I've actually found that uh, whilst that, that's a study that's often quoted, I've actually fallen into that and um, uh, and a clear example of, you know, finding the little things just to make yourself feel better uh, mm -hmm. by looking good, smelling good, um, and then having that as a pick-me-up, which might not necessarily to be a necessary budget item, um, especially when things do add up quite quickly. Quickly, yeah. But you know what, Google? I think when it comes to personal finance or when it comes to money, it is okay to spend and enjoy the little things that life has to offer as long as you've done the right things. And what I found interesting lately is that I find a lot of women tell me, you know what? My income, my salary is not enough to do my nails, my hands, you know, get pretty. But I do have a side hustle. I've started a side hustle so that I can still enjoy myself. So I think it's definitely something to consider. So one of the last few questions for you, Google, what is your biggest driver um, that is pushing you forward? You know, something that saying, I want to be a success for your hard work and the success that you have attained so far. What is that biggest driver for you? Sure, Mabalo, I think it's quite simple. And I guess there are many examples that allude to it. But number one, as I mentioned earlier in this conversation, it's really about having a positive impact in the lives of people that I meet. And, but I also realize that for me to have a positive impact in the lives of the people that I meet personally or in a professional capacity, I also need to be at my best. Mm -hmm. And that means really tapping into the multiple talent pools that I have at my disposal, some of which I've been able to use and they've really grown and advanced and helped me, you know, carve a niche for myself in the industry that I work in. But I'm also well aware that there are many other talents that I'm able to, to tap into. And whilst imposter syndrome, fear, uh, being concerned about how the execution will actually happen are all the things that, you know, do keep me up at night sometimes. Mm -hmm. They might hinder my progress from time to time when you delay uh, actually starting a, a new project or, or something of significance. But what I've actually found is that for, for me to really attain great success is to continue tapping into discovering the new elements and the various sides of Ukuku. Um, what that entails continues to be a layer that is revealed year after year uh, with the benefit of, of life and the benefit of hindsight. But I, I really think so many of us really have multiple opportunities to tap into, and we see it. You mentioned the side hustles. Uh, we mentioned the multiple careers that the both of you actually have, and many other women are exploring. So if not, why not? We've got one life to live. 
make sure that you live it thoroughly and fully. Um, and that's, I guess, my big motivator to make sure that someday when I happen to close my eyes, I'll be content to actually say, you know what? That was a life well lived. Oh, oh I absolutely love that, Google. Well said, very well said. And for me, really, that just says show up, show yeah. up, show up. When you're scared, show up. When you're uncomfortable, show up. And um, you are a true reflection of that so far. Thank you so much. Now, Siba, for your last question, what is success to you? And has the definition changed from when you started in your career? It's a very complex question in a sense that success can mean a lot of things to different people. But for me specifically, success means I live what I was born to do. I don't mimic someone else. I am authentically who I am wherever I am and very comfortable in my own skin. It means that I proactively go for my dreams like a, a roaring of a lion. <laughs> now proactively go for them. And when I fall, you know, I, I, I stand up, brush myself up and then run again. It means that in the process of acquiring, I'm also taking some people along with me in the journey. In the process of pioneering and breaking down barriers and doing everything that I'm doing, I am creating a path for many so that you're not the only one who's done it, but you have allowed many others to also come in. And my book, for instance, is testament to that. Before that, many people know uh, there were no Black authors before uh, my, my first cookbook, um, My Table. Um, et cetera, and many other stuff that I started within the food industry. And that for me is success. It also means, uh, it also means that acquiring wealth, it means acquiring wealth that will be a legacy to my family and my children once I'm no longer here. Oh, Siba, you are such a trailblazer. And I think that anyone who's watched this webinar has completely fallen in love with the both of you over and over and over. I certainly have. And thank you so much for being vulnerable because talking about this thing sometimes is not easy. So thank you so much for being vulnerable and talking about this with so much grace and with so much ease. Um, and now we are going to go to the Q&A from our audience. Thank you so much, ladies. Thanks, everyone. The Q&A is exploding, and I know we don't have much time, but maybe, ladies, if you don't mind, um, questions specifically to Gugu. Um, you have touched on the most important investing. How do you know you have chosen the right investment? Oh, well, I would complicate the answer, but I guess the simple way to look at it is if it's meeting your goals or if it's on track to meet your goals. And I think that's the beauty about investing, let's say, you know, we talk about it and sometimes we use all these big terms and jargon about, you know, what the P.E. ratio is and the dividend yield you'll be receiving. But the truth is, whatever it is that you're putting into this pocket of investment uh, and the term that you're going to keep it in there for, how long and what the objective is, Continue to ask yourself those particular questions. If you planted this particular seed five years ago and you expected it to grow into a specific uh, outcome, uh, have those outcomes been met five years on? Uh, or even if you're in the middle of that investment decision, those are some of the intricacies that you need to be asking yourself, but also be mindful of the reality of the environment that we're in. Who would have thought we would have had looting in the middle of July? Who would have thought that we'd be sitting on day 500 and whatever we in of the lockdown in March last year? So when it is that you're working on, on your investment objectives or deciding whether you've made a good investment or not. Number one, ask yourself if it is on track to meet your goals. And number two, even if it isn't, be cognizant of also reflecting on the type of environment that we're actually in. And if there have been any typical hindrances that have stopped your investments from actually reaching the goals that and expectations that you wanted to fulfill. Other than that, sit patiently on your hands, take your time and continue to plow into creating wealth for yourself by investing for the long term. Thanks, Gugu. What a great answer, because ultimately, I mean, often we fall into the trap to compare our outcomes with, with our peers. Do you know how am I doing versus my peers? But they don't have the same objectives. Um, so why are we comparing, um, you know, that behavior to compare? Siba, one question for you. How did you transition from being a creative, talented chef to harnessing in and being more hands-on? into the business so how was that journey and did you take any skill courses I mean did you reach out to develop these new skills 
Yes, that's a very good question, actually, because the the transition was not easy. First, I left formal employment. I was a food editor at Drum Magazine at the time, got an opportunity, was headhunted by Food Network, and it required me to be available um, for them, meaning I had to stand up on my own two feet. And I took the plunge simply because it was such a great opportunity for you for me to have refused. And it started off as being a freelancer. And a freelancer was great because it's just just, just me, myself, and I had no responsibilities. <laughs> to everyone else but then there comes a time where you really can't do everything yourself and there's some jobs that are just too ministerial for you to be doing administration for instance taking inquiries etc so you need to entrust someone so i started little by little i started as per growth if i needed someone to help me with um with um just answering my inquiries then i'll have someone who answers me that and then that grows according to what we're doing in terms of the business then i quickly realized that oh my goodness i can't just be hiring as per need i need to be more strategic. So I took um, a few courses uh, locally and internationally online, which then helped me in terms of how I can structure business. And also I was uh, privileged enough to have access to people who can help me structure the business consultants, um, etc. So it was not an easy transition in the beginning because I used to do everything myself. But with time, once you get the right um, uh, um, right skill set uh, with, with with that you come across that become part of your business, whether it's your employees or your consultants, it becomes uh, better. I think the hardest thing for me was to let go, you know, having to let go and let other people do it, you know, and not having to micromanage because I've always been done everything myself. And I've learned to let go now because I've taught people enough. And I've also, which is empowerment in itself. And I've also have entrusted people who've been in industries in business for a very long a long time who know far more than me so i know i'm in safe hands thanks thanks siba that's great insights letting go and trusting the experts we have to wrap up, unfortunately. We're already a minute past the, the webinar. Thanks so much, Mapalo, Gugu, Siba. It's been opportunity to understand what has connected you to your goals and dreams. Um, and I would like to say on a personal note that I am exceptionally passionate about planning. If you want to achieve success in anything in life, you have to plan for it. And, and that's what we've heard consistently coming through um, from the panel today. So I have the utmost admiration for you because you have all the talent in the world. But if you don't set a goal, commit to a plan to achieve this and work very hard, you are a lot less likely to end up where you want to be. And it is very interesting for me to hear who you went to for different kinds of advice and your mentorship on the way and your approach to good debt and business. So on this note, I would like to invite all of you to the future webinar about the power of planning. The top tips for financial success. This will be on the 16th of September from 10 to 11 a.m. So all please dial us this, but we'll be sending you an invite to remind you. Thank you, our financial advice experts, whether it's about banking, lending or investment objectives. We are all looking forward in connecting you to more. Good afternoon.